Charles Malky, biologist and plant expert with Ivy Organics where we grow cool plants. And today we're gonna to be talking about citrus trees and how to stake them, bend them, and prune them for optimal success so you can have a bountiful harvest of lemons as I'm gonna show you right behind me in just a minute. The first thing I wanna share with you is um, our product, Ivy Organic 3-in-1 um, Tree Guard. If you take a look over here, is a three-in-one tree guard where you just add water. It's a natural tree trunk and branch barrier protection against damaging sunburn and insects and rodents for use on your roses, fruit, and nut trees, ornamental trees, and shrubs. And, and this product is non-toxic, environmentally safe, and organic. And if we take a look at the lid over here, it says ideal for new plantings and transplants, save injured and damaged trees, prune and expose surfaces. And that's exactly what we're gonna be using the product for today. And what I'm most excited about sharing with is this week, it was um, registered material, as you can see over here, for use in organic agriculture. Um, and it was issued by the Washington State Department of Agriculture. So this certificate will be on all the product labels going into 2017 and forward. So keep your eyes look, you know, looking for that, but it's now been issued as registered material for organic use and farming, which is fantastic news. The first thing we're going to be talking about is when growing your citrus, something to keep in mind, and I drew two pictures and clearly I'm not an artist, but of these two pictures, what I wanted to share with you is this one over here first being, I wrote that it's top heavy tree. And there's a lot of tree over here compared to the amount of roots. And this is not an ideal situation. And again, I wrote the top is greater than the base, the roots. The roots are smaller than the amount of branches and leaves and fruits that it's supporting. The ideal situation, and this is an extreme situation, it could be a little bit larger than this, but the point is you want the base, you want the roots to be strong to support all of the branches and all of the leaves and all of the fruit. And when you end up with a plant that's too top heavy, that's when you start having a lot of dead wood within the tree and a lot of disease and the plant, the roots are just not supporting all of the growth that's above and the amount of growth that will be happening among the plant is going to be nominal compared to what it could be if you've got a strong base supporting a beautiful tree up above and not an excess amount of plant um, in relationship to the roots. So the first thing we're going to be talking about is when it comes to citrus, Citrus require the least amount of pruning, and most of the pruning that's done is only for cosmetic purposes. If there's ever dead wood, remove it. There is no dead wood in the, in the plant behind me, but there is some pruning that is needed, and I'm gonna share with you why. The first thing we're gonna do here is this branch is in this walkway that um, I'm walking backwards into, and it's gonna ultimately grow and block this um, way, and the goal is we're gonna bend this and keep and preserve this branch on this side of the fence. As you can see back here, these branches are supporting a ton of fruit. And as people walk into my garden, they just go in awe over how much fruit is being supported by this tree. And I want these branches to come and overflow over the fence and, and basically showcase the fruit. So what we're gonna do instead of pruning this branch is we're gonna pull it. And what we'll do here is we'll just take some twine and what we'll always do, and in every one of our videos, whenever we prune or stake or do anything, we always tie the knot to the stake or the supporting structure, and never tie the knot upon the tree, and I'm gonna share with you why in just a moment. So we tie the knot there, we're then just gonna wrap it loosely around the plant, and now support the branch closer to the supporting structure. And now we've got the branch out of the way of the walkway and we've done absolutely no pruning. Within the next few months, this entire plant will go into bloom, even though there's some blooms in it, it pretty much blooms year round, but it's the spring blooms, which will happen anywhere from here in Southern California, particularly Los Angeles. Um, from about February, March is when most of the blossoms will occur and those will support the majority of the fruit that'll then um, ripen in the winter, which we're going to enjoy. And by the way, we're doing this video at the very beginning of November. Um, so you can have your bearings as you can see what we're doing and what you're seeing here in the garden. 
The other thing I want to point out too is when you've got your branches, you want every single branch to ideally be optimized by the amount of light that it's receiving. Each branch is, imagine, an individual tree. And you got to treat each of those branches as needing its own light requirements. The issue that I see here, if you want to um, come around and take a look at, are these two branches that are parallel to one another, that both going in the same direction. I'm hoping you can capture this. This one over here is a little bit thicker and, um, and longer. And then there's this new shoot that's coming out over here. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna prune it out because this branch is, sh um, for one, creating excess amount of shade over it. And this branch alone is gonna um, always struggle, one with disease and two for light to support the fruit. So we're gonna end up removing this particular branch. And hang tight while I go and um, get my pruners. So here I am now on the other side of the um, tree, and we're just gonna go with our pruners. And when you prune it, I've seen a lot of landscapers, they'll sometimes just cut randomly like so. This is not ideal, as this is gonna end up dying back and become an entryway for wood boring insects and pathogens and whatever else. When you prune your tree, you're gonna to wanna to make sure you get as close as you can to the bark without stripping the bark. Like you wouldn't wanna rip the branch down the side of the tree. So we've just pruned it as close as we can to the bark. As the tree expands, this wound will um, end up going back inside the tree. And what we're gonna do here is I've got my Ivory Organics 3-in-1 Tree Guard paint. I've just mixed it before the video. I'm just gonna stir it here just a little bit and take my um, paint solution here and we're just gonna seal that wound. You can actually just do it with your finger or we'll go with our paintbrush and just brush the entire tree trunk as you can see we've done a few months ago and we'll just seal that whole thing like so. So we just coated the tree trunk with the Ivory Organics. We're um, more importantly now concerned about have the entryway of pathogens into this entry point. We're talking about wood boring insects as well as bacteria, viruses, and anything else. It's now sealed uh, by using this organic paint, which has also got a lot of natural oils, which naturally repel and preserve the tree. What we're, what I've also spotted as I was painting the tree is if you take a look at this string over here, we staked the plant when we installed it about two years ago, and we made sure again we tied the knot against the stake and not against the tree but the tree has expanded so much and we had a loose knot around it originally, but now it's expanded to the point that it's tight and it's constricting against the wood. So I'm gonna have to remove this tie. And unfortunately for the last few months, it's been strangled as you can see over here. And hopefully you can see that indentation that's gone into the tree. So I'm gonna re-support it after the video um, and improve that. But that's another important reason why you gotta be visiting your trees. But you can see over there, it's been you know, strangled on this side of the tree. Most of the sugars and waters have been traveling now through the backside um, where it was not being constricted. And this could have compromised the health of the tree. It probably wouldn't have killed it, but it would have definitely affected the, um, the ability for the plant to support the maximum amount of fruit. Let's take a look at one other thing. If you come over here to the next tree, This was an issue I was hoping to share with you, and hopefully you can catch this. My finger is pointing right here um, at what was the string supporting the tree, and I wanted to share this with you viewers that the stake is, right, if I can get my hands through here. So the stake is over here, I'm holding onto the stake. The knot is on the stake, wraps around the tree, and the string has come undone but it's also got grafted into the tree. The bark has now grown over the twine. We're gonna now try to carefully try to get that out without tearing the bark too badly. And we got it out, but you can see that I've damaged the tree some right there. As I pulled it out, the bark ripped. And again, another entryway for disease. You can see if I've, I'm trying to clean it up, but the bark's ripping as I'm pulling on it. So what we're gonna do is just seal that real quick. Let me get the product. I'm just gonna go here with the Ivory Organics 3-in-1 tree guard and 
just dab it right in there. And that'll now seal it to make sure no disease tries to enter that point. Let's go off to the next plant. So here we had another branch that we simply pulled into position. If you take a look at this branch over here, it was originally, I'm gonna let it free. It was originally too close to this branch. And as we made a point at the beginning, each branch has to be treated as an individual tree. Each branch needs its own amount of sunlight um, so it can support and gain the most amount of sugars per leaf to support the maximum amount of flowers and ultimately fruit. By having these two branches together, you're either gonna wanna pick one or the other or pull them apart. And in this situation, we pulled this one down. I'll correct this later after the video, but you can see that what I did with this one is, let me get that knot loose. But what we did is we pulled these two branches away in different directions, so as the sun travels overhead, each of these branches will support its and gain the maximum amount of light. One other thing I want to point out is these thorns. Modern lemons are generally have very small to no thorns, but for whatever reason we've got some large thorns that are also coming. And what I wanted to share is that you can and take a look at how big these thorns are. They're probably about an inch long, but this is not typical. Um, but something you can do, since this is close to a walkway, you can easily just prune those thorns right off so that as people walk and enter this garden, including myself, there's no risk of getting stabbed in the eye so, or having your skin stabbed when you're reaching for those lemons. So another tip, if you've got those large thorns, just remove them off, but typically when I see large thorns on people's lemons that don't match the rest of the plant, take a look at the base of the plant because usually the thorny branches are coming from a sucker, which is the base of the plant that it was grafted upon and not, not, and not the um, desired fruit quality that was grafted onto the rootstock. I've seen this in many gardens where people are like, what is this? It's growing totally different. It's got bigger leaves. It's got spiny, sharp thorns. And then you'd follow that branch down and it's coming off of the base of the plant and it's a sucker and it's um, not a desired citrus variety. It's just something that's providing the plant with a disease resistance or it's controlling its growth or it's um, offering drought resistance or root rot resistance and dozens of other benefits that a rootstock can offer to a tree. These are grafted Meyer lemon trees that are grafted on a standard rootstock. So these trees as Meyer lemons will only grow somewhere between 8 to 12 feet whereas um, if the same standard rootstock was grafted, for example, on a Eureka lemon tree or a navel orange or other type citrus, they'd grow even taller, closer to about 18 to 25 feet. But Meyer lemons generally do not get that tall, even though there are exceptions. Meyer lemons are generally more of a compact, more shrubby, um, and shorter growing. Um, but because they're grafted on standard rootstocks, there's a lot of growth going on. Come and check this out. So take a look over here you'll notice that there's all of this growth happening. And this is, again, the first week of November, and we've got at least another three to four inches of growth right here, um, a little further back. This entire branch was a sheet that came down to where my right hand is and has grown at least three to four feet before I cut it because it was another three to four feet even taller. And I'll explain to you why I did that. But the point is, there's a lot of growth going on because these plants are grafted on standard rootstocks compared to, and I've got right here below me, another Maya lemon tree. This Maya lemon tree is grafted onto a dwarf rootstock. This plant will only grow a couple of inches if you're lucky per year. The dwarf is only gonna grow on average between two to four feet, maybe five. It already is supporting fruit. This here fell off as I was picking it up, but you can see that it's already got you know some a genetically identical quality um, lemons to these standard lemons. Um, size is supposed to be the same, the taste, the quality, the seed count, everything identical to the Meyer lemon tree that's grafted on the standard. The only difference is this is more compact, it's smaller growing, kind of a bonsai shaped um, lemon tree. But when picking up your citrus from the nursery, 
be cautious on what you're picking up. If you're picking up a standard tree, a semi-dwarf tree, which will have more of a medium amount of growth, somewhere between six to up to 15 feet of growth. And then this year we just talked about dwarf. And then standards can grow anywhere from um, 15 to 25 feet. So make sure you plant the right citrus in the right area so you accomplish what you want. I've seen too many gardens around where people have planted this tree and it happens to be a dwarf and they're like, one day we're gonna enjoy a 20 foot tall you know, lemon tree in that corner or an orange tree. It's just not gonna happen because they planted the wrong tree and I could tell by the way it's performing over you know, year after year. If it's on standard rootstock, it's supposed to be growing um, at least six inches to a couple of feet per year compared to a dwarf on the other extreme that's only gonna grow a couple of inches a year or a few inches per year, not feet. So come and zoom in on this um, Meyer lemon tree. Take a look at the, the fruits that are down here. These are gonna be ripening any week now. We then have just behind me all of these. Here's a baby lemon right there. A couple of little blossoms next to it. Some more blossoms over here. Some more blossoms over there. But again, these are not the main blossom. Then right behind it, we've got all these smaller fruit. So a lot of different things happening right here. And take a look at these, this little cluster. So you got a medium sized lemon and then the baby lemons. So a lot of different things happening within here. What I wanted to point out here, so far all we've done is bend a branch. What we're gonna do here is we're gonna stake this branch and we're gonna want it to grow up in its own, in its own space away from the center of the tree and try to turn this into a tree. By having it lean towards this way, it's going into our walkway and again, Remember, when it comes to citrus, you're only pruning your plants um, to control shape. And um, otherwise, citrus require very little to no pruning. Um, in this situation, we're going to actually pull this branch back and try to have it grow as another tree in this zone right on top of what I've got is a patch of mint that's down here below. And all I'm going to do is stake it. And then we'll take some more twine. And again, we're careful to not put the knot against the tree, but instead against the supporting stake. And, and now we'll pull that back. And now we'll have, let me cut this back. And now we'll have this branch this branch supporting all of its leaves and all of its flowers and all of its fruit in this zone. We're going to have a lower zone with all of its fruit and flower down here. And again, it's out of the pathway all around the plant. So we've just accomplished that with staking. Let me show you some pruning examples now. Follow me. If we take a look now on this side of the plant, you'll notice that I pruned all of these ends off over here and there another one over here as this tree was growing this tree was growing a few feet into this common area so we simply cut it off another thing I noticed is on this side over here is another branch that's about to take off I told you I pruned this one back just a few weeks ago with all of these other branches and now this is starting to grow more it's starting to put out a lot more growth but I want it to become more balanced. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this branch down to about the same height as here. And what I'm looking for are the branches where it's already branching naturally. So I've got three more branches that are coming out. And what I'll do is I'm gonna prune it right to the next first branch that's coming off. And we're gonna prune it about a quarter inch above it and at an angle so that water doesn't collect on the top of it. So if it ever rains or the dew that's in the morning will um, will come off of it and then we're just going to seal it here real quick. So it's not exposed and then that's it. By removing the tip of the tree, as we've discussed in other videos, the plants are making hormones. There's root hormones and then there's um, shoot hormones and this here being the shoot is making a lot of auxins. And auxins encourage root growth and development, and it's going to help the plant continue to grow. But it also inhibits any lateral growth, and that's why there's no branching coming off anywhere near where this shoot is. But what's going to happen now by removing 
the tip, and now that it's got less auxins flowing through the plant, the cytokinons are gonna encourage more root and shoot development. So now that there's less auxins within the plant, it will encourage these branches and the rest of the plant to also now shoot and become a more balanced tree. And we're doing this all at the same time as we're harvesting the lemons over the upcoming weeks so that it will maximize the amount of flowers that we're gonna get come early spring, which will support again the maximum amount of um, fruit that our family is gonna get to enjoy. Let's take a look at one other thing. So what do we do if we've got a compact small plant? How can I possibly use Ivy Organics and paint them on when all the branches are just so small? I'm gonna share with you in just a minute, but come and zoom in at how cool this plant looks. We just um, created it from an air layer just a few weeks ago. Take a look at the blossoms that have since formed. Um, you got some blossoms. Take a look up over here in the corner. You can see a lot more blossoms. And on this side over here, it's starting to also shoot. You can see that there's new leaves that are also coming out. So a lot of blossoms, some growth. All of these things are happening. And this all came from an air layer that we took off of this corner, right up here, if you wanna take a look. So that came off of this point right here. This was an air layer, and since we've pruned it, there's a new branch that's gonna take its place. But right here is um, the spot. And this plant that we took it off is a semi-dwarf Eureka lemon tree. So I stand six feet tall, my reach is eight. So you can see how tall a semi-dwarf Eureka lemon tree could potentially get. And take a look at all the fruit that are in here. It's an amazing plant. Take a look at all of these lemons. We got some yellow ones on the way. We got some smaller green ones that'll hopefully go into spring and summer. Take a look at all of these clusters. Tons of lemons. Very productive, doing very well. So, so we just discussed, this plant came off of the Eureka lemon tree behind me. A semi-dwarf. So what's gonna happen to this tree? What is, what is it? Is this gonna become a semi-dwarf tree like this? or because it's so small, is it gonna be in the dwarf category? Or, and the right answer is, it's gonna become a standard size tree as it's sitting on its own roots. A dwarf tree is grafted onto a dwarf rootstock, a semi-dwarf tree is grafted onto a semi-dwarf rootstock, and then these um, Meyer lemons to my left are grafted onto a standard rootstock. And if you zoom in over here, and it's not quite so easy to see, but you can see that this here is the rootstock, and then it's been grafted onto, there's a thickness in the height, but I'm gonna show you another example where it's very clear, grafted onto the desired flavor and quality of fruit. So this is offering, again, the disease resistance, controlling the height of the tree, um, root rot, drought resistance, and all the other benefits that the root's offering that the tree alone probably would not otherwise have. Let me give you a more clear example. Check this out. Check this out over here. This here is a guava tree. You can see that it's got a fruit that's close to ripening over here. So on this guava tree, I grafted this, this variety. Here's the rootstock you can see. This here is a pink variety and then I grafted it onto a yellow variety that was of superior flavor. You can clearly see the difference between the two trees as this bark's got a lighter bark color in this one. And you can see the graft line right here. Very clear. Rootstock, desired fruit flavor. Let's go back. So, because this is standing on its own rootstock, it will grow to a standard sized lemon. As if I were to take a seed and plant it, Lemon trees generally grow to a height if they're not grafted to anywhere from 20 feet minimum to as much as 30 feet on the maximum and possibly even taller. So we're now gonna embrace a lemon tree that's gonna grow as much as 20 to 30 feet. We'll control it with pruning or whatever else, but the root is gonna be that vigorous that's gonna encourage a 20 to 30 foot tall tree because it's standing on its own rootstock. And again, this is not a grafted variety and by subscribing, you're gonna to get to watch how this tree is gonna develop. The other thing that some of you might have questions about is how is it possibly flowering at this small and compact size of a tree if it's a standard tree? And the answer is 
is because this is wood that is in fact 158 years old. This was planted here in Los Angeles in the 1800s um, from some seeds that were derived from Italian origin. And the first Eureka lemon came out of Los Angeles and was thereafter propagated and grafted and made cuttings all around the world. And so this plant, by taking cuttings off of it, you're moving plants that are well over 100 years old compared to planting a seed where you're dealing with now a young plant and waiting the years that it's going to take for those to actually grow and, and, and support flowers that will ultimately support the fruit. That process, if it were to naturally occur and you're going to wait the time from planting a seed to becoming a, a fruit bearing tree and hopefully a desirably um, tasting fruit bearing tree, um, that process can take anywhere from five years to as much as 15 years. So you're saving all of that time by taking a cutting or in this situation an air layering from a desired tree. And in this case we um, created this Eureka lemon tree. Compared to this, we've got our dwarf variety. This one here is now grafted, our Meyer lemon, onto a dwarf rootstock. This here will only grow an average of two to maybe four or five feet. So again, they both might look the same, but year after year, this is gonna grow feet, whereas this is only gonna grow inches. So make sure you're looking for the right tree and introducing the right plants into your garden. Back to, how do we apply Ivor Organics to this plant? When we installed it into the container, and I'll put the video link to um, this particular video, we sprayed it with the Ivory Organics, and I'll share with you that all you need to do is take um, two teaspoons of this product, add it to some water in a spray bottle, and then just coat it like so. And you can protect, again, any of your prune and exposed surfaces, as well as for all of your transplants. By coating it, it'll keep your plant cooler as it's now created a shield. Um, and cooling off the white leaves by applying like a white film to the surface of the um, plant. And take a look at what that looks like. You can take a look over here, a little bit of the whiteness that's showing. And again, it's protecting it, one, by keeping it cool. And secondly, it's also got these oils that are within the product. You can smell a lot of these oils that are coming off the plant that are gonna repel insects and, give, and protect the plant so it can give it its best chance of getting established. So by spraying the plant, you're not just cooling the plant, but you're also protecting it as it's got these essential oils that also repel insects from potentially um, bringing in disease or compromising the health and the life of the plant. If you've liked this video, be sure to like it. And most importantly, subscribe down below so you'll be connected to all the other Ivy Organics educational gardening videos. Thanks again for watching. Happy gardening. Mm -hmm.